we've been discussing why we should care about whether we have any moral obligations, why we should be concerned with doing what's morally right or morally wrong, why we should be motivated to do what's good and avoid doing what's bad. And remember, at the end of our last lecture, we discussed the Ring of Gyges, which was a story told by Plato in the Republic where a man named Gyges finds a magical ring that can make him invisible. And so when he puts this ring on, becomes invisible, he goes and does all sorts of terrible things that we normally would not do. Things like murdering his enemy, sleeping with his enemy's wives, stealing, all sorts of different terrible things. And this story was supposed to indicate to us that what really motivates us in life is the fear of being punished, the fear of people finding out about our terrible actions. So the reason why we don't do bad things is because we don't want to be punished. We don't want people to find out about these things. And the reason why we do good things is because we want praise. We want people to see what we've done such that if we could get away with doing whatever we wanted to, then we would do all sorts of terrible things. So while this story about Gyges and this magical ring is supposed to say something about human nature, you know, it's supposed to tell us that our human nature is really kind of selfish. So if you think that something about this story is correct, if it's saying something true about human nature, then we will need some reason, some external thing that's going to motivate us to be good and to motivate us to avoid doing what's morally wrong. The question I want to consider now is whether God could be that reason, whether or not God grounds morality. So let's look at that in a little more detail. Suppose that you could, like Gyges, get away with awful crimes, maybe because you're invisible. The law will not know, so you won't be punished. Your friends and family aren't going to know, so they're not going to care. No one will ever know what you've done. Right? So you're exactly in the situation that we talked about with regard to the Ring of Gyges. If you were in this situation, what would you do? Would you do all sorts of terrible things? Do you have a reason to refrain from committing these sorts of crimes? What about guilt? Would you feel guilty about doing these things? Or does the feeling of guilt come from the fact that you might get punished? People might find out about it. This might work for some, but of course it's not gonna work for everyone. That's because there are people like psychopaths and sociopaths who just don't give a shit about guilt. They don't feel guilt. And so having this feeling of guilt is not going to be something that would motivate them to refrain from committing all sorts of terrible crimes. So if you think that morality is universal, right, if it applies to everyone everywhere, then even those who do not feel guilt should have some kind of motivation. They should have some sort of a reason for not committing the crimes discussed with regard to the Ring of Gyges or any other sorts of uh, moral atrocities, moral wrongs. And this is why some people think that we need God to ground morality. If God is what grounds morality, the morality would apply to everyone, even to the psychopaths and sociopaths who simply don't care about whether they're ever found out. They're not motivated by these sorts of reasons. So then even if it's true that no one on earth will ever know what you've done or what the sociopath has done, still, God will know what you've done and God will punish you in the afterlife for the things that you do in this life. This is the issue that we want to consider now. Perhaps God grounds objective morality because of God's commands. This is sometimes known as the divine command theory of morality, right? So what, what grounds the reason why you should be uh, motivated to do what's good and avoid doing what's wrong is because God has, has made certain commands like don't murder. The basic idea there is what should motivate you for why you should be good and avoid doing what's wrong is because God has commanded you to do certain things and avoid doing other things. For instance, if God says that murder is wrong, then it's wrong. And if you violate that command, then you've done something wrong. We can put this in the following way. 
X is morally wrong if and only if X violates God's commands. So we can literally plug anything we want in for the variable X to say whether or not it is morally right or morally wrong. And Y is morally permissible if and only if Y does not violate God's commands. So if you want to know whether something is okay, if, it, if it's permissible, you just have to figure out whether or not it violates one of these commands. So then what about murder? Why is murder wrong? Well, murder violates God's commands. Why is drinking milk morally permissible? Milk is fine because it does not violate any of God's commands. What about a positive command, like the idea that you should help the poor? Or what about someone who is suffering? Right? So if somebody is drowning in a river and you have the ability to save their life, it looks like you should, you should save their life. If you can do it, uh, then, then it seems like you're obligated to do it. If there's a child, for instance, who's drowning in a little tiny kiddie pool and that's happening right in front of you and you decide not to pull the child out, we would totally think that you've done something morally wrong. We would usually hold you morally accountable to some degree for why the child died, if the child died. So in these sorts of situations, it looks like we have a kind of a positive command. We have a moral obligation to do something. Morality requires us to do something. Now, it's not clear that there's any positive commands in the Ten Commandments, for instance. So we might wonder whether or not all of the Ten Commandments really are more. There's quite a few prohibitions, like don't cheat, don't steal, don't murder, don't covet your neighbor's wife, these sorts of things. But the Ten Commandments also have positive commands that don't really look like they're moral in any normal sense, like the command to keep the Sabbath. What about an atheist? The atheist doesn't care about the Sabbath. So in what sense is this going to be a moral rule or a moral obligation or requirement for the atheist? Or the, the command, do not worship any other gods. Again, the atheist doesn't believe in any god. So that would not apply to them. So these are some things that we should, should maybe think about and, and be worried about. Because it looks like the Ten Commandments themselves may not equate to God's commands. God's commands are just whatever God says. Maybe that some of the Ten Commandments apply, maybe they don't. Nonetheless, many people are convinced by this sort of view, the divine command theory, that what grounds morality is the fact that God commands certain things. So let's think about this in more detail. Some will find the following sort of claim highly compelling. If God does not exist, then everything is permitted. You could do whatever you want, sort of like as if you were the, in the situation where Gyges puts on the ring and becomes invisible such that nobody will ever find out. If there is no God, then there is no ultimate sense of punishment in the afterlife. So you may be able to get away with certain things in this life. And since there is no God to punish you in the afterlife, then there's no justice Right. Think about a situation where, you know, Hitler murders millions of Jews. If there's no God to punish him in the afterlife, then it looks like there's no justice in this sort of case. A lot of people find this sort of view very compelling. But if God does exist, then God will punish you for what you've done, for the wrong actions you've committed, and God will reward you for the right actions you've done. So if God does exist, then Hitler will be punished for his crimes, and you will be punished for yours as well. Even the psychopath or the sociopath who seem to have no reason whatsoever to act morally, even they will be punished for their crimes in the afterlife and rewarded for what they've done right. So when we say that they also have a reason, what exactly is the reason that's supposed to apply to every single person equally in every single case? What, what makes this objective or universal? Well, the basic idea is if our human nature is self-interested, then we would want to avoid the wrath of God or the torments of hell. And we would want to gain eternal life and eternal happiness in heaven. So to put this quite bluntly, our motivation is the threat of punishment and the promise of reward. And yes, of course, 
this is a self-interested way of thinking about our motivation for why we should do what's morally right and avoid doing what's morally wrong. This view assumes that all human beings, even the psychopath and the sociopath, are essentially self-interested creatures. We care about ourselves more than we care about anything else. We are motivated by what happens to us. That's why we want to avoid the torments of hell and why we want to enjoy the rewards of eternal life and happiness in heaven. Now, you might think that in this sort of case, it seems to be that appealing to God as the grounds for morality will give us a way to make sense of why morality is objective. That seems fairly plausible. Nonetheless, there are problems that we need to consider. There's reasons to be skeptical of this sort of view. Arguably, morality would not be objective, even though it seems initially to, that it would be objective. So why would we be skeptical about whether or not morality would be objective uh, on this view where God grounds morality? Can you think of examples where someone, someone appeals to God, for instance, to justify actions that we normally would find to be terrible or immoral? For instance, I think most of us, if not all of us, will agree that slavery and segregation are immoral. They're terrible things. Nonetheless, historically speaking, both slavery and segregation were defended by appealing to the Bible and appealing to God's will. So the idea was that slavery and segregation were justified because God thought it, they were morally permissible. They did not violate God's will or God's commandments. So in this situation, you can use the existence of God to justify doing something that we would normally think is entirely immoral. In fact, the Bible, for instance, never actually condemns slavery. You might think that if God is the source of morality and God communicates to us through the Bible, then that would be a really good place to tell us about the horrors in the terrible situation of slavery, why slavery is immoral. You might think that God would correct us if slavery really was wrong. The authors of the Bible oftentimes go out of their way to tell us that something is morally wrong, something that we intuitively probably think is perfectly fine. For instance, most of us would probably agree that being gay is morally permissible. Nonetheless, the Bible condemns being gay. Why would the Bible condemn being gay, something that we intuitively accept as morally acceptable? Nonetheless, the Bible fails to mention anything about the horrors of slavery. It fails to condemn slavery. Take, for example, the 9-11 terrorist attacks. This is a classic example where the terrorists use their religion, their belief in God, to justify what they've done, things that we would normally find to be morally horrific or consider female genital mutilation. You may not be aware of this, but there are places in the world where the custom or the religious tradition is to circumcise young women. And the reason why they do this is because they don't want women to feel sexually aroused. The idea, I guess, is that if, if they aren't sexually aroused when they're an adult, then they're far less likely to to have an affair or cheat on their husband. So they circumcise these children, these young girls, so that they can't feel sexual pleasure as an adult. So this kind of female genital mutilation is justified by appealing to God, uh, by appealing to their religious traditions. So it looks like we have another situation where someone could do something we normally would find horrific by appealing to their belief in God or consider the Jonestown Massacre. If you're not familiar with this case, it involves a cult that traveled to South America, I believe, and they, they all decided to commit suicide, every single one of them, by drinking Kool-Aid. And this included their children. Parents literally gave Kool-Aid, poisoned Kool-Aid to their children, killing their children, and then committing suicide themselves because they believed that this was God's will. They justified these atrocities, these moral wrongs, by appealing to their religious faith, their religious belief. 
So instead of thinking that if there is no God, then anything is permissible, you might say instead, if God does exist, then anything could be moral. Even those things that we would intuitively and naturally think are terrible, terrible wrongs, immoral atrocities. While this idea that appealing to God and God's commands to ground why something is morally right or morally wrong. So let's think about this in more detail. Why is it that appealing to God as the grounds for morality actually makes morality relative or subjective rather than objective? One way we can see this is by looking at what's known as the Euthyphro dilemma. Here's how it goes. Remember, we're considering the divine command theory, which grounds morality in God's commands. God commands and forbids various actions, and whatever God's will is, is what determines whether something is morally right or morally wrong. So this dilemma, which comes from Plato, says, does God love good action because it is good, or is some good action good because it is loved by God? There's two horns to this dilemma. The first horn says, X is good because God commands it. And the second horn says, God commands X because X is good. So let's look at the first horn. What if X is murder or slavery or genocide? In these sorts of cases, it would actually be morally wrong not to commit such an act, right? And that's because X is good insofar as God commands us to do X. So if if God commands us to commit genocide or to own slaves, then that is what's morally good. On the other hand, this seems very absurd. This seems ridiculous. This would make morality relative to whatever God's will happens to be. And you might find that implausible. Now let's turn our attention to the second horn. The second horn says that God commands something because God recognizes that it's good. But in this case, God would not be a divine command giver. Rather, God would be simply a divine messenger. God sees that something is good, whatever that might be, and then tells us about it, tells us not to do it. This is not going to help us understand what grounds the goodness of that thing. So we're still in a situation where we don't have an answer to the question that we've been asking. What grounds morality? This is a classic objection to the divine command theory, but there's other reasons that we might be skeptical to this approach to the question of what grounds morality. For instance, punishment and reward may not be the best way to motivate us. This may turn out to be a problem. Is it really the case that punishment or the hope for some reward in heaven are good motivations? They may be good psychological motivations, so pragmatically speaking, it may in fact motivate us, but does that make it a good reason for doing something? Consider the following sort of case. Suppose that your friend is sick in the hospital. Maybe your friend is experiencing cancer. Now, if I said to you that I was going to pay you $5,000 every time that you go to visit your sick friend, this would probably be a powerful motivation for why you should do this action. If, on the other hand, I were to say, you know, if you don't go and visit your friend who's sick and suffering ca from cancer, then I'm going to tax you $5,000. Well, this would probably be a really powerful motivation for why you would, in fact, go and do it. But none of these things are good reasons for why you should visit your, your, your friend who's sick. It looks like the right sort of reason would be just the mere fact that they're your friend and they're suffering. You should go visit your sick friend because you care about them. So it looks like the fear of punishment and the hope for reward may not be good reasons for why we should do things, why we should do what's morally right and avoid doing what's morally wrong. Another sort of objection that we should think about has to do with atheists. It looks like an atheist has the ability to live a morally good life, right? But this seems to be a problem for the divine command theory. It may be the case that you would object to God as the grounds of morality on the basis that there are many atheists out there in the world who don't believe in God. These people, these atheists, are perfectly capable of making moral judgments. 
there's nothing special about being a theist, right? Being a theist doesn't make it more likely that you're going to do what's good or avoid doing what's wrong, harming people. So you may think the fact that atheists are just as capable of doing good and doing wrong as a theist might be a problem for this sort of view. Still, people will disagree. Some have argued that atheists actually have no grounds for morality at all. That is, they'll argue that atheists are committed to some sort of relativism, some sort of subjective view of, of what grounds morality. Nonetheless, you might think that this is simply false. In fact, you might think that this sort of view is somewhat insulting. There are many atheists who reject moral relativism. The mere fact that somebody does not have a belief in God does not automatically mean that they believe morality is relative. Likewise, there's many atheists who reject moral nihilism. You know, the view that says morality is an illusion. There is no morality. So maybe the idea then is supposed to be that an atheist has no grounds for morality. Not necessarily that they can't live a moral life, but simply that they have no way to justify why certain things are morally right and why other things are morally wrong. But this is simply a question of metaethics which applies to everyone. This is not something that atheists alone have to face. The theist has to deal with this issue as well. And again, there's nothing special about being a theist. Both the atheist and the theist have to face the question of what grounds morality. It's possible for the atheist to endorse an objective medical theory just as much as it is for the theist to do so. And the atheist does not have to appeal to any sort of divine entity to do this. And if that's the case, if that's correct, then it's just not obviously true that somebody must accept the existence of God in order to ground morality, in order to ground what makes something right or what makes something wrong. 